that would um, prevent us, Lord, from seeing as we ought to see, knowing as we ought to know, sensing as we ought to sense, hearing as we ought to hear, would be dispelled. Lord, we take authority over this meeting right now, over every opposition, every demonic spirit that would rise up against the knowledge of God. I take authority over my own mind and my own hearing, my own understanding right now, in Jesus' name. Lord, I will be directed by your spirit and not my soul. I will be directed by the things that you send and not of man. I will be directed by your will, O God. Lord, as we know in Hebrews, that beautiful passage that was spoken of you, that you came to do the will of God. Lord, I pray that your will today, Lord, would be done. Lord, not just in this meeting and not just in what is spoken here, but Lord, across every heart. Lord, may something be laid across every heart. May be may there be something that is permanent, something that is indelible, Lord, laid across every heart today of your will in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. What we might do, just while I'm speaking, is there any chance we could just lean forward and just touch on mute? Um, because there is a little bit of background noise feeding back. Is that okay? Uh, if you've got questions and things at the end, uh, we'll turn our mutes off and we'll have a chat again. But it um, might be good just for now, just to lean forward, just pop mute on, so um, the message isn't interrupted with uh, accidental noise or... Cats, dogs, phones. Um, how's that sound? Awesome. Well, here we are. Um, Genesis 15. Just so you know, we are recording this uh, like we do at the school as well on the other camera. So this is going to be... At, um, it's going to go up to YouTube as well as we're going to try and practice recording this on a device as well. Um, this app also gives us the opportunity to record. So if you want to record, I believe there's a setting that you can touch on on your screen to record and it will record it either to a device or up into the cloud. Um, right. But we'll, we'll discuss that down the track um, next week. Awesome. All right, Genesis 15. Um, this is important. This is the beginnings of our faith, our Christian faith, through that of Abraham or Abraham. There was an obedience that took place that is an obedience that is final. And this is the, the key area that I want to touch on today. It's Genesis 15, verses, verses 8 and on. And I'll read it out. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it. So he said to him, this is God speaking to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all those to him and cut them in two, down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down and the carcasses, 
on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, Knowingly, that your descendants will be strangers in the land that is not theirs, and will serve them. It goes on, but I want to touch on the issue of obedience. Abraham was given an option, or no, given a command by God to bring five animals. The beasts were cut in two, the birds were not. God is bringing us to a place now that we would read these verses and apply them to our own walk and to our own life, to our own faith. If our faith is Abrahamic, it will have its origins in complete and total dependence and obedience on God. The moment that we decide to help God uh, by, by withholding any part of our lives, our faith is then null and void of what is called Abrahamic. So true faith is Abrahamic. Would we agree with that? That the, the issue of faith is the issue of Abrahamic faith only. It has to be given. Abraham did not receive that. Sorry, Abraham did not have that or possess that faith. It was something that was imputed to him by God. Amen? Now, I know we've covered this before, but it's important that we, we recognize that we do not have faith apart from it first being imputed or given to us. There is something that's so pure and so real that I want us to catch this issue of the sacrifices that Abraham brought to God. He was told to bring those animals and to cut them asunder. Verse 9, Bring me, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram. Those animals were sacrificed. They were cut in two. There is no retrieving of that animal. <laughs> There's no... There's no bringing that back off the altar. There's no glue known to man that can mend that animal. It is to the uttermost. It is completely and totally final. When we give our lives to God, unless we're giving him our whole life, our marriage, our mind, our finances, our careers, our desires, our wants, our dreams, until they are laid asunder, as in divided in two, so that they become irretrievable. There is no bringing back my uh, status of being a single male after I'm married. Amen? Amen? When I've cut a covenant of that seriousness with God, I cannot go for myself or help myself to becoming single again. I've cut a covenant of marriage that is permanent. Just like when we become saved, we come into the kingdom and we give him everything. It is to the uttermost. It is to death. It is totally final. And if our faith is not of that kind of faith, it is not Abrahamic.
It has some kind of taint. It has some kind of mixture. And God is calling us back to what is pure and what is true faith. All of history post that moment on Mount um, Moriah with Abraham, with his son, was, was a precursor for everything that was to follow. If Abraham had failed in this area of faith and obedience, if he had withheld one turtle dove, one pigeon, the smallest of things, we can bring the biggest things that we've got to God, our careers, our hearts, our dreams, our visions. But if we withhold in one area, and it might seem insignificant, it might seem small, it is no longer Abrahamic. It is now null and void. You have now voided the covenant relationship by withholding. See, the good news for us with Abraham was he was a procrastinator. He, he delayed his obedience. And we've all heard this said before, but obedience that's not total or is delayed or is um, uh, withheld with Holden in some point is not obedience. And this is a great picture and it gives me great comfort about the fallenness of man. Now, should I be comforted about fallenness? <laughs> well, only to the point that it proves that Abraham was human as well, that it is possible for us to walk in this level of obedience. God has cut this covenant with mankind. He's cut covenant with fallen man, with your fallen nature. It's okay to fail. But it's not okay to walk away. It's not okay to try and catch up to God at some other point in my life. Now's the time of salvation. Now's the time of repentance. Now's the time when we hear his word that we have not hardened our hearts as in the day of rebellion. Now is the time to come back. When we have failed God, that is the time to return to the Lord. Amen? So Abraham came out of a number of things. He came out of family. He had to leave his father. He had to leave his country. He had to leave his stuff. Can we leave all behind again? Can we leave behind Christianity? <laughs> our stuff, the things we value, our friendships, our times of fellowship, after the service, before the service, the service itself, these things are being placed on the altar. Who are we to withhold even that from God? Can we see that God has taken even what is familiar and known to the church, our service? My God, we've made it such a thing that that we've got divisions all over the planet because we don't agree on certain styles or ways of worship or certain styles and ways of meeting. And God has had enough. And as we know in this church, quite clearly has been communicated that the church of Jesus Christ is Christ in his people, not in a meeting. Amen? Raise your hands if you agree. <laughs> it's Christ and a people. 
And this is why we can have true fellowship via video. We don't need to be in a building, amen? God is touching at the moment everything that is dear to man. But he's also handing man over to the very thing that has been dear to man all along. This Greek concept, G-R-E-E-K, Greek, <laughs> wisdom, independence, knowledge, learning. that's apart from God. This desire, this fallen nature in man that desires so much to be independent of man, independent of, of each other, independent of family. It's easier to be independent because I don't need to be challenged. I don't want to be challenged. I don't want to deal with family, I don't want to deal with relationships, I don't want to deal with those things that are tough, I don't want to hear another tough message from fireplace, I don't want to hear the, the gospel preached at me, I don't want to feel or give myself an opportunity to feel condemned or come under anything that's harsh or hard. And so majority of people today have become so independent we've got no place or no time for true fellowship true community and God in essence is handing the whole world over to what it desires independence like he said in Jeremiah 44 that you wanted that you wanted your own independence down in Egypt. You wanted the things that you want. God says to Jeremiah, let them have it. He will hand us over to the very thing that we desire. So here we all are, stuck in houses. There's your independence. Have it. The interesting thing is what's going to happen as a result. We're coming to a precipice. We're coming to a a day of decision. Are we going to seek God in this time with everything that's within us? And I've heard that, that statement and that phrase made by a number of people on Facebook recently and on YouTube saying that this is, this is an important time of getting to know God and, and we need to seek Him and we need to believe and we need to have faith and we need to trust what the word says and and these are all great general statements but in essence it's not even true now I want you to hear what I'm saying here I've heard so much generality around this coronavirus outbreak that we've got there's nobody in the church that's actually making a statement and interpreting the times and the seasons for the times and the seasons that we're actually in. Again, we've got a minority voice or minority voices speaking that this virus is something that is sent by God. I've heard a lot of teaching in the last few days. I'm just trying to gauge, I'm trying to get a litmus test of what the main body of charismatic, on fire, revival seeking charismatics are preaching. A bit of a litmus test of where the church is really at. But we're speaking in generalities. We're saying we need to seek God, but what does that even mean? You're talking to a video camera now telling people to seek God and they can't pay their bills on time. <laughs> they can't honour mother and father. They're still listening to the world's music. They're still watching the world's movies. They're still given over to 
carnal thinking. We're told to have faith, but what does that mean? We're given generalities and we're told to believe for revival that God's going to bring something great out of this and it's going to be revival. God's going to revive everybody and it's all going to be great. But there's nothing that requires me to do anything other than just trust that, well, this pastor says I'm going to, revival's going to come to the earth. That's all I've got to worry about now. As long as I, I just seek God. I've got to seek God, I've got to read the Bible and I've got to believe. See what I'm saying, guys? It's so general. There's nothing requiring of me. Have we given up our lives? Have we trusted God to the uttermost? Have we given up everything? Or are we still trying to help ourselves? Are we still hedging our bets? I want to give an example. I've just lost my job. And I have no income now in front of me is an opportunity to go and and try and get a job and I can strive and I can apply to everything that's around me or I could just trust God and go God what are you saying what are you speaking do you want me to work right now are you truly my provider Or do I have to go and help God in that? Has God sent me to the workforce again? Has God sent me to a secondary job? Has God sent me to something else? Or is this a time of just waiting upon Him? You know, I saw something interesting the other day. A, a local ministry here has, is preaching the gospel, preaching about revival, but at the same time, they're saying you need to trust God for your finances. But they've got their hand out saying, can you support us? To me, that's not, tr that's not true faith. If you've got your hand out to man, asking man to support you, you're effectively retrieving for yourself a turtle dove, a pigeon, another animal back off that sacrificial altar. Have you given God your finances? Have you given God everything? And as a pastor, as a leader, as a minister, you better have because if you're asking people for money to support your ministry, as a priest, <laughs> so-called, you're now endorsing and teaching people to do likewise to reach out to man see God is going to justify the Gentiles by faith amen Paul said that Abraham lived it by obedience Righteousness was imputed to him. And it's the same today with us. Will we allow God's righteousness to be imputed to us by faith? Or have we still got a handout to man? God says to Abraham, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Amen. I will provide for you. Now, one of the areas I want to touch on today is be very careful about ministries that are asking for money. When the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 asked the people for for finances he said as i spoke to those in galatia also i speak to you that on the first day of the week that you would gather 
But guess what? It was never for Paul. Amen? Those finances Paul was asking those to contribute were for the saints in Jerusalem. <laughs> not for Paul. Not for Galatia. Not for Ephesus. Not for his ministry. They were for those who were in need in Jerusalem. We need to be really careful about this issue of asking for help for our ministries. Guys, I'm speaking to you as leaders in the body of Christ. Amen. I'm not speaking to baby Christians. I'm speaking to those who know the Lord but also to be very careful about who we align ourselves with that are on the take. Preaching one thing, preaching that I live by faith, but at the same time, we've got their hand out to man. How can you live by faith with your hand out to man? Jesus himself was supplied his needs by Mary, and the two other sisters. Amen? Remember that? I don't recall the Lord Jesus asking for money for himself, ever. <laughs> Everything about where we're at today, I believe God has bringing us back to the foundations. We've spoken about this at the School of Ministry. We're coming back to the priesthood, the faith, those things that were at the first will be the very things God will restore at the end. As in his beginnings, so are all in God's endings. So the priest was not to take for himself. Paul's priestliness himself, you'll see in Philippians, you'll see in 2 Corinthians 5, he said on a number of occasions, these things are for your sake, not for his sake. It was either for your sake or for God's sake. Remember? Remember? If I'm a fool, I'm a fool for God's sake. If I die, I'll be with the Lord, but, but it's for your sake that I'll remain. It was never for himself. He would never take to himself. He would say, um, whether I'm abased or whether I abound. He was often without food. Let's read a verse here. Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, believe it or not, goes in front of first Philippian, sorry, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Anybody surprised by that fact? I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether we feed, sorry, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And what's verse 13 say? I can do all things. But we don't hear the verse 12 normally, do we? We just quote, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But that's got to be read and it's got to be understood in context. Can you, believer, be in want right now? Can the Lord take your income off you? Can he take everything off you? Can he strip you of being, oh, sorry, of being living in abundance? Can we lose what we've got? 
Can he take our houses? Can he take our finances? Can he take our food? This is important. These are all things that once, once upon a time as a Christian, we laid our lives down, didn't we? We said, God, I give you my life. I lay my life down. I put these things on the altar. I'm going to make you Lord of my life. So to be, to be Abrahamic, to have Abrahamic faith is to have our house asunder on the altar, have our possessions asunder on the altar, have our desires, our dreams, our food even asunder on the altar. What if those savings that you've got stored up in the bank, that you've worked so hard, you've stewarded so well, you've tithed on, you've given, evaporate? What if that evaporates overnight? Where is our heart? So going back to Paul, I'm wanting to highlight some issues of the heart, especially in ministry. So I'm, I want us to be awakened to what true ministry is about, which is priestliness. It's something that we've been learning this whole year at School of Ministry. Cheryl's been teaching this and I've been teaching it and it's something that we've been teaching for a while. But I want us to come back to, again, what is, what is truly priestly? 2 Corinthians 11, verse 9, Paul says, And when I was with you and in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my needs. I have refrained from being a burden to you in any way. So, how can we go asking for financial support for our ministry? Look at the next statement Paul makes. He says, I have refrained from being a burden to you in any way and I will continue to do so. So it wasn't just a one time, I'm just, I've got my needs supplied for my brothers in Macedonia and I'm coming to you now, and I'm not a burden to you now, but maybe in a year's time, maybe in a you know, six months' time, maybe when demand comes up, I will be a burden to you. No, never a burden to you. In fact, Paul said that he worked with his own hands, <laughs> so he wouldn't be a burden to the churches. Where do we get off asking for support? This flies in the face of charismatic, normalized Christianity that you and I have grown up with and become accustomed to, and it's become so normal that we don't think anything of it. Nobody challenges this stuff. But I tell you, this comes right back to the roots and the core of the faith itself. The faith of Abraham was the faith that gave all in obedience. It was taken to the altar and divided asunder, everything. The great and the small. Abraham did not withhold a turtle dove from God. And neither should we. The big things need to be sacrificed upon the altar and the small things, the things that seem insignificant, the small even concepts, ideas that we have of the faith of Christianity might seem small to us but all the stuff God wants at all the faith at the moment is being examined by God from top to bottom from priesthood to bottom and judgment begins in the house of God it begins here he needs to heal us of some unclean thinking and I'm not talking about 
perversion. I'm talking about anything that has fallen, anything that is trying to retrieve something back from that altar. When Abraham had those animals cut asunder, it was, had become irretrievable. You, there's no going back. Anybody remember to Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall? <laughs> Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, didn't he? And all the king's horsemen and all the king's men could what? There was no putting Humpty back together, I'm sorry. And this has to be the same for the faith of, of Jesus Christ. When we come into the kingdom of God, we give him everything, including our freedom. Here we are cooped up in homes. Can we give God our freedom? In India right now, only one person in a family in the north of India, I just spoke to someone overnight, they permitted one person out of the house a day to go to the market and to retrieve some food, if there's any food. If there's no food in the market, then you come home empty. But they're saying that they're enjoying, at the moment, the time of fellowship with the Lord in the churches. All the churches are the families. They're all independent of each other in the homes, all seeking God. They're having true fellowship. See, true communion is true fellowship. We can't be in communion with each other if we don't know each other. And you can't know each other in a church of 10,000 people. You can't know each other in a church of 200 people. Let's just be honest. We're permitted to hide. We're permitted to withhold. We're permitted to uh, abstain from being exposed or confessing our faults one to another. As long as we turn up at the service, we give our money and we go home, everybody's happy. But true communion is something deeper than just turning up at a service and drinking a plastic cup and taking a wafer on the tongue. Independence is being dealt with at the moment. What God is after is something that we spoke about at the School of Ministry. It is the sacrifice of the animal. It is the revealing of what is inward. That has to be exposed. That has to be revealed to us. We need to know who we truly are. And we're not going to know that until we come into the presence of God. Until we yield and give in to Him and come into true fellowship with each other. Being honest with each other about our own walk and about our own condition. We can't put on the nice Sunday face any longer. God is wanting truth in the inward parts and the only part that was a pleasing offering and a pleasing fragrance to him was that which was hidden. The fatty lobe on the liver, the kidneys, the things that man tosses out are the very things that are precious to God. Those most inward moments, those most inward grueling moments being exposed, being found out for who I truly am, coming to a place of deep repentance with tears where there's a guttural cry where just like the animal was slayed that you were totter to the floor on your knees, gut-wrenching repentance and weeping. God, I have sinned. God, I have failed you. God, I have failed my friends. God, I have failed my wife. God, I have failed my husband. God, I've failed my boss. I have not lived up to the glorious Abrahamic faith that we're called to. If we're living beneath 
God's standard. It will be exposed in a smaller community than in a large one. In fact, in a large community, nobody even knows anything about you. You've got two hours to put a face on every week and God's saying enough. He's put a stop to this worldwide. The whole church has been arrested and been parked up. I remember a prophetic word about 18 months ago saying God is going to bring the whole church down on its knees and he's going to put an end to what is false. And we're going to finally see what the true church really is that it was never about a building, never about a meeting, never about a time or a day of the week. It was always about his son in people. So here we are again. We find ourselves now at the mercy of God, as Tim brought up in Lamentations. His mercies are near every morning. There is a way of repentance it's coming to God new every morning God wash me cleanse me forgive me even cleanse me from my Christian thinking my ideas of how church should go or how ministry should go my Christianese my my ideas about how finances go supporting ministries let us come back to what the Bible says about what the true priesthood is. That the true priests of God, and we've got great examples. Let's look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave everything. He received for himself nothing. I've spoken about this before, but there's a beautiful man of God who lived in India in the early 19th, sorry, yeah, early 19th century. His name was Sadhu Sundar Singh. When he travelled to the villages, he would preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. At the end of the meeting, he'd close his Bible, put it in his bag, put it over his shoulder, and the Lord would direct him to the next meeting. If they fed him, he would eat. If they didn't feed him, he wouldn't eat. He never asked for help. He never asked for ministry support. He never asked for new sandals. He never asked for assistance. He was directed by the Lord and would be sent as the Lord directed. And he would testify numerous times. Well, Lord, I've preached the gospel and, and it looks like tonight that you don't want me to eat. Tonight's a fasting night. Amen. And he would move on to the next town. And sometimes, even at the next town, he wouldn't be fed again. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In fact, the next town, I think he got thrown in a pit and was left there for days without food and water. So, can we come back to what is truly priestly? What does the minister of the gospel minister? Do they minister Christ? <laughs> or are they still taking something for themselves? Even unconsciously, subconsciously, wanting something for ourselves disqualifies us from the priesthood. And this is where we need the true fear of God. Remember we, we spoke about Abraham. Great darkness fell on Abraham when the sacrifice was received by God. The flaming torch and the oven passed between the sacrifices. Great darkness would fall on, on Jacob before Jacob was caught up in a vision ascending that ladder great darkness would fall in other words it brings an end to man it brings an end to everything that we can possibly do and it says with great dread <laughs> the presence of God came on Jacob it was a dreadful and it was an awful experience we need to look at these words again 
What does dreadful really mean? What does awful really mean? What is, we say awesome all the time, but do we know what awesome is? It means basically to lose your breath. Your breath is taken out of your lungs because of the, the awe and the dread of God's presence. But we've made God all too familiar now, and now he's our buddy. And we think that's cool, and we think, well, that's, that's New Testament God. God is, God is our buddy now. He's our mate. And we bring him down to something less than he truly is. And this is where we're at today. The fear of God has pretty much departed the church of Jesus Christ. We don't have the fear of God. In fact, the word fear is seen as a negative connotation. Yet, there has to be a fear that is not scared of God, but a, a fear that it reverences Him, that is put in its proper place, its proper position. He is awesome. He is surrounded by dreadful great darkness and lightnings and earthquakes and the mountains shake. But conversely, he will supply all our needs. He is our hope. He is our provider. He is always near when we're in great need. And this is the balance that needs to be brought back in. Amen? We need the fear of God again back in the church, back in our own hearts, back in our own lives. We are the church. We will not be greater, or the church will not be greater than who we are. So in this room, we've got four people other than myself. The church will not be greater than Christ in us in this room. So we are the church. It's down to us. We need to fall on our faces. We need to come to a place once again of restoring what is Abrahamic, a truly giving ourselves and everything that we've got over to the Lord again and being reminded not to take anything back for ourselves. Provision in particular, and especially we've been tested in this at the moment. I'm being tested in this myself not having an income, not having a job. Can I trust God? Someone tried to offer me a position recently and the moment that the words leave, left their mouth, something gripped my spirit, something grabbed me and, and it was straight away, it was, no, no, this isn't God. I could easily take this role but it wasn't sent. It wasn't from God. It wasn't trusting God. It was... Remember Joseph said when he was in prison, he put his hand up and said to the baker, please remember me. <laughs> when you go out, please remember me. And God smiles to himself and gives him another two years in jail because he wasn't ready. The moment that we put our hand up and say, please remember me, please help and support my ministry, please help me in some way outside of God, we disqualify ourselves from true priestliness. Can we receive correction? Can we receive the loss of all things? Can we count the loss of everything? I know it's a tough thing to say. There's people out there that are about to lose their homes, their mortgages, their, their cars, their livelihoods. Can we count all these things as dung except Jesus Christ? And we're being tested in it. Each single one of us has been tested in this area right now. So thank you, Lord, for... Your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Or that we would come back to true priestly faithfulness, which is Abrahamic at the core. It's a giving over 
in a once and for all and not retrieving anything back for ourselves. If there's any benefit or loss for me, it needs to remain on the altar. If there's anything that I would gain from this particular thing, we need to put it back on the altar and not touch it. I am your shield. I am your rewarder. I am your inheritance. Is Christ enough? <laughs> Can I trust God to feed my family? Can I trust God to feed my children? Can I trust God to provide my medication or provide healing for my ailments? These areas are going to be tested in us and the, the world are looking at the church right now. This is the gospel that Paul preached. It is glorious. It's been given to the Gentiles. And the good thing is, is that the gospel that we received from Paul has a string attached. That the nation of Israel are looking to us. And God has seen to it that that's the order of things, that we would stir the Jewish nation to jealousy. And if we don't have this, if we don't possess this, they won't possess it. They won't come in. It's up to us. Amen? First Peter 1, 8 to 9, I'll close with this. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled, filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Isn't this awesome? This is an ongoing work. So, you know, straight away, I know condemnation works over people's hearts and minds. I don't feel I can live up to this kind of a message. It's too hard. It's too strong. It's too heavy. I feel condemned. You know, I get these comments quite regularly. The problem is, is that condemnation is a spirit that seeks to bring division and discouragement. But God is maturing us through these times to a glorious faith that the end result of our faith will be the salvation of our souls. So we need to focus, and God is speaking to the church at large worldwide now. And he's saying, it's the salvation of your souls that I'm concerned about. Forget your ministry. Forget evangelism. Forget all your tent revivals and your healing ministries and stadium-based evangelism. What's God done to all that? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> what has God done to stadium ministry? God has given himself to us. We have got to give ourselves fully to him. Galatians 2.20 The life that I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He is your and mine exceedingly great reward. Amen? He alone. Let us not dare steady the cart, help ourselves in any way.
Can we let God be our sufficiency? This is a, a beautiful time of, of re returning back to the essence and the very core of the faith itself. The Abrahamic faith. He said to Abraham, in you I will bless the families of the earth. And I want to speak to your hearts today that in you, fireplace family and friends, God will bless the nations and the families of the earth. But it's going to come first and foremost when we have an Abrahamic walk, when we have given our lives, we've surrendered our family our culture, our Christianity, our finances, our health, our careers, our Christian upbringing. All these things have to be counted as loss except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I said I'd finish on one verse. I've got one more verse and we'll close on this one. Romans 8.32. This is awesome. This ties into the heart and essence of God, His nature, who He is, and speaks to Genesis 15. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also among with him graciously give us all things? It takes place by a once and for all. If there's not the once and for all, if it's not the a giving over to the uttermost, to the absolute laying down of everything within man, then we are disqualified and will not receive graciously the imputed righteousness of God that he has laid up for each one. The faith to walk in this journey if we're struggling with our faith thoughts and our, where we're going and what we're doing and we're, our security is, is being shaken right now and we don't have a boldness, then maybe there's something that we're still hanging on to. Maybe there's something we're withholding from God. Maybe there's that turtle dove that we've taken for ourselves off the altar. The faith that comes from God alone is unshakable. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. Lord, I bless the hearing and the seeing of this word today. Lord, I pray that something, Lord, of this word today would grip us and would impute uh, not just the hearing but the doing of it, Lord that we know that faith is not just a mental ascent, but it's, a, it's an act, Lord. Abraham had to perform a sacrifice. He had to give of what he had and cut asunder in a once and for all giving and laying it on the altar that you would pass through it, Lord. That's the kind of covenant that you have cut. That's the kind of foundation that's in all faith, Lord. That's the foundation that is of true faith. Lord, may our hearts come back to the essence of that. And Lord, enjoy these times, Lord, of, of coming back to you. 
seeking you, Lord, in isolation. Like John said earlier, coming back to those booze, Lord, coming back to that time of, of seeking you alone, of spending time alone with you, waiting upon you, hearing your voice, hearing your heart, giving of our time. Lord, I praise you that one of the greatest things that I've overlooked today is the issue of time on the altar. We have withheld from you time. Lord, a commodity that is, that is incredibly expensive in this age and in this time. Lord, forgive us, Lord, for, for withholding time from you or bringing time back off the altar for ourselves. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.